Hi. I'm Aziz. And I love products. Some products I have a slightly unhealthy relationship with. <laughs> but I love them nonetheless. Those are the products that I'm interested in today. Everyone's got them, right? You've got apps that you are completely in love with. So maybe it's a coffee. Maybe it's a service. Maybe it's an airline. I want to hear a few of them. Richard, could you just put the house lights up? Tell me. Tell me an app. Tell me a product that you are completely in love with right now. Sorry? Graze. Graze the snacky yeah. thing. Yeah, I agree. It's a good one. City Mapper. City Mapper. I didn't hear that one at the back. Simply business. You can't just crouch shout out your own company. <laughs> Come on. Anyone over here? Spotify. Spotify. That's a good one. Notational Velocity. Spotify. That's a good one. <laughs> Why do you love Spotify? Because um, I like discovering new music. I like this. Yeah. Um, how does it make you feel? Great. Yeah, it makes her feel great and it helps her discover new music. They're pure products, right? Thank you, Richard. They're pure products. They're things that feel different, yeah? They're not the run-of-the-mill products. They're the products I'm interested in today. They're the products I want to talk about. Um, the American philosopher John Dewey says that learning is not only in the experience, but in the reflection, and the reflection is also uh, partly reflecting, partly being pensive and reflective, and partly it's about debate. So I really encourage you to debate this concept, the concept of pure products. It's, pure products is an Azizism, um, but I really encourage you to debate it. Um, Prashant, whoever is, he's somewhere in the room, please debate it. Um, tweet me direct, use the hashtag, debate it in the room. If you agree with it, say so. If you don't agree with it, say so. I'd love to evolve this concept. I'd love you to evolve it with me. So like I said, it's an Azizism, but the facets of pure products are grounded in data, uh, research and academia. But as far as is possible throughout this presentation, I'll try and use real examples and keep it as grounded as possible in reality, in the day-to-day -day reality of what you guys do. So it all starts with this, products. This is a guy called Anthony Rebo. He and his brother um, run a Rebo agency on the South Coast. Uh, guys from Tesco probably know him. A few of you will have, will have worked with these guys in the past. And over um, beers and burgers on the beach in Brighton, there's a lot of bees, um, we started talking about something that I think everyone has had this debate. It was quite, a, quite, a, quite an intense debate. And it was the debate of how does one construct the perfect burger? You see, Anthony had in front of him what could only be described as a monstrosity of a tower of a burger. And it was held together with, you know, it, it wasn't so much a cocktail stick, more a, more a tertiary branch off a tree. <laughs> and his point was that for all of the beauty of this burger, for all of the layers of different cheeses, for all of the bacon that is just all over this thing, this is not a burger. Because if you have to use a knife and fork to eat it, that is not a burger. Everyone knows. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Everyone knows that the height to mouth width ratio is the key ratio when creating a burger. It was a failed product. So here's the truth. 99% of the products that you use, you'll never notice. We've all used products, hundreds of products today. You woke up this morning, you, you, um, you, know, you went to the bathroom, you brushed your teeth, hopefully. You uh, got out, you, you took the train to get here, you queued to get a coffee, you got into it, you're all sat in chairs, you're wearing trousers and skirts, and these are all products that you aren't consciously aware of, you don't notice them. But then there's sort of 1% of products that you do notice, and of that 1%, 99% of them, so that's 0.99% of all products, you notice for a bad reason. Your coffee was cold, your train was late, the zipper on your trousers broke. But then there's that 0.01%, the 1% of 1% that you notice because it makes you go, wow, that was awesome. They are pure products. They are the products I want to deconstruct today. They are the products that I want us to understand. 
My journey of understanding of these products started quite early on in my career. I, um, I started in product management. I'd worked for quite a while before this, but I started in product management at lostminute.com. Uh, and you know, this was before the time of Mind the Product, and actually it was a really painful experience for me uh, because I hadn't a clue what product management was. Um, my boss really did know what product management was, but he came over from the state, so it was, he, he had that kind of perspective on the world. Um, and really, I was... <laughs> it wasn't meant to be a joke, but thank you. Um, he, and really, uh, you know, I, I struggled, honestly. I struggled to really get to grips with um, the challenge of being pulled in a million different directions. But I learned a lot very quickly. I had to. And then my uh, knowledge sort of took another jump, and that happened when I met you guys. Product Tank. Product Tank was a massive impact on my career, because all of a sudden, in that first product tank, I was surrounded by 15 people who were also being pulled in eight different directions, who also had the pain of having to make a million decisions with no authority, who also fought the corner of the customer when it felt like everyone else didn't really care. That was, it was a counseling session. <laughs> But it was also incredibly powerful for my career. The next thing that really drove uh, my understanding of product management and pure products forward was my MBA. Yeah, so I think an MBA is the product manager's degree. You get to look at sort of uh, problems from eight or nine different directions. It's incredibly valuable. It's still valuable for me today. But there's something that happened in my life that really drove my understanding of product management, yes, but pure products in particular. It was an unexpected consequence of having children. I had two children. Um, when you have kids, you get three awesome things. Firstly, you get to eat ridiculous food, like this. No one says anything. Apparently, by doing this, you're a good father. <laughs> you get to go to the cinema and watch cartoons in 3D, and nobody looks at you like you're weird. But most importantly, you get to see your kids using products for the very first time. <laughs> Look, this may seem like, um, you know, exploitation of my children. <laughs> and it is. But they're my children. Watching children use products for the very first time, for me, was a magical experience. Because all of a sudden, you could see which products they really loved, which products actually resonated with them really well. I always say to, my, to designers that I work with, and product managers, before they show me a new design or a new workflow or a new prototype, I said, just don't show me anything yet. Give me the context. Who am I? Where have I come from? What was the acquisition channel? Um, am I a repeat customer? Am I a new customer? Do I recognize the brand? Give me the context. Now you've given me the context. Show me what you want to show me. And then I'm very conscious of the first time I consume that new design. It's a very conscious process because I want to know how do I feel? What was my instinctive reaction? What did I want to press first? These are the questions that you wouldn't ask if someone had just put it out in front of you, put that design in front of you. And so it's something that I use every day, and I, I try and teach everyone who I've ever worked with. You only get one chance to see something for the first time. So recognize when that's about to happen and make the most of it. Uh, for me, it's really helped in, in uh, making sure that I understand products in the best possible light. And it's really important for, for pure products in particular, because the first time you see a product is when you'll know whether it's pure or not. Pure products are instant. I mean, you instantly fall in love with them. All right, so what's a pure product? A pure product is a combination of two things. It is both profoundly simple and exquisitely beautiful. Both of these concepts are quite in-depth, and I'm going to start with the easier of the two to explain, which is profound simplicity. To, to help explain what I mean by profound simplicity, I'm going to use some research from a guy called um, Carl Wake. He's a uh, a professor at uh, the University of Michigan. He's a, an organizational theorist. And he talks about profound simplicity as a, a process of understanding. The first step is superficial simplicity. So superficial simplicity is simplicity through the lack of complexity. 
Yeah, it's de facto simplicity. Uh, this would be an example of something that is superficially simple. It is simple because it lacks features. It is, and Palm Pilot made a business out of doing this very, very successfully at the time. For me, this is lazy simplicity. It's really easy to take a product, strip it of features, and call it simple. That's not a challenge. I can do it. I'll do it now. I'll take this pair of trousers, and I'll strip away the seam, and I'll take away the zipper, and I will, um, I'll take away the belt clip, and I'll rationalize it in my head and say, all I'm really trying to do is cover my legs. And so I'll simplify this product so much that all I'm really left with is a sarong. <laughs> and I conveniently neglect the fact that I look like a complete idiot <laughs> because I now have a simple product. Now, this is lazy simplicity for me. The next thing that Carl Wake talks about is sort of the next phase of the process, where one recognizes that lazy simplicity, superficial simplicity, is not acceptable for products. And so you end up going through a state of confused complexity. In my opinion, most products, digital products in particular that exist today, are in this state. You may use the term bloatware or over-engineering. But in this context, I'm saying it's a confused complexity. So imagine that you took the Palm Pilot, and all of a sudden, you need to shove in all of these apps. This is just a confused, it would become a confused product. Incredibly difficult to navigate and master the simplicity of this product. Um, the true glass hole looks a little, like, a little like this. I mean, this is just a confused complexity, right? This is just nonsense. An organization has thought we want to try and create an interface that you interact with through your eye, and they've just stuck bits onto a person. <laughs> Makes no sense. So a confused complexity is where most products start and end. This is where they are. And actually, it's, it's perpetuated. To, to, for a lot of organizations, the, the role of product is to prevent that, because often it's perpetuated by commercial teams saying, coming back from um, clients saying, the client wants this, and you end up building more and more weird little features. And it's just a mess by the time you're done. So the key is to get from this state to this state, to profound simplicity. And profound simplicity is when you take all of that complexity and you master it. You master the complexity until that all that is left is complete and utter simplicity. It is not easy. But if a company was to try and master the complexity, the inherent complexity of the products that, that shown here, they may end up with something like Glasshole, which I now, uh, this is the official term of <laughs> Google Glass. So. Mastering the complexity delivers profound simplicity. So this is the key thing that I, this is my sort of key mantra. And that profound simplicity, as it relates to pure products, profound simplicity is not merely the absence of complexity, but the exquisite mastery of it. Master complexity and deliver profound simplicity. So here's a few examples of products that I think are profoundly simple. Booking.com is the only way I now book hotels, thousands of hotel rooms, knows where I am, shows me the prices, shows me so much information in just a couple of taps, got my credit card details done. But for me, the, one of the most profoundly simple products I've ever used is this. Take a bow, George. Halo, the best thing I can say about Halo is that if it didn't exist, my life would be more complex. It's true, my, my life would be more complex without Halo. And the reason I find Halo to be profoundly simple is just think of all of the things that it does. Halo knows where I am. It knows where I am. It knows where taxes are around me. It recognizes the distance between the two and the time it will take to travel between the two. It then offers my job to a taxi. And if he doesn't accept it to the next person, the next person, the next person after that, until someone finally accepts the job, then the taxi comes to me. And then I get into the taxi, and it drives me to my location. And when I finally get to my location, I pay, I tip, and I get a receipt, and I get all of that from one little button. Pick me up here. That is the mastery of complexity. That is profound simplicity. Does that make sense? <coughs> Nods would be good. 
Because if it doesn't, this bit you're not going to get at all. <laughs> so we move on to beauty. Um, for me, uh, there is a, a definition of beauty which is perfect. It's from The Tempest. It's uh, from William Shakespeare's The Tempest. And it says, uh, Hear my soul speak of the very instant that I saw you did my heart fly at your service. And the reason, the reason this is the perfect description of beauty is because it contains the three elements of beauty. Hear my soul speak. The recognition of beauty is not a left brain activity or a right brain activity or even an activity of the brain or the heart at all. It is an activity of the soul. Hear my soul speak of the very instant that I saw you. And when you see something beautiful, you recognize it instantly. Did my heart fly at your service? And once you recognize it, you are entirely subservient to it. The perfect description of beauty. But here's what I find when I meet product managers all around, is that you know, Carl Sagan said that every kid starts out as a, as a natural born scientist and we beat it out of them. We beat it out of them, a few trickle through. I really find that true in our profession too, right? Because what I'm talking about when I talk about beauty is the instinctive, instinctive recognition of beauty. Instinctively knowing whether something is beautiful or not. But how do you measure beauty? Well, you can't. Not really, not with a metric, not with a number. And if you can't measure it, it's not valuable, right? I mean, that's how most organizations are working. If it's not a conversion rate, or a revenue number, or a profit number, or a traffic number, if it's not something that you can measure, it's not valuable, right? No. For me, this is, a, this is a, a trend that we have to get over. We have to retrain ourselves to recognize beauty, and I, I truly believe that we can. A lot of you will recognize this number, particularly those with a design background. Um, this is a fee. Uh, it is also known as um, the, uh, the, the beauty number, the divine number, the divine ratio, the, the beauty ratio, the golden ratio. You'll have come across the term, I'm sure. And so this is sort of an explanation, if you like, of beauty. You see, I can take Kate Moss, and I can take the ratio between like her chin and her head, and then the side of her head and the other side of her head, 1.6, so beautiful. And I can do the same with the Mona Lisa, and I can say the ratio between like her hands and the top of her head and her shoulder and the other side of her shoulder, and it's, it's 1.6, beautiful. And I can take this sunset, and I can do exactly the same thing and explain why this sunset is beautiful. I don't buy that at all. It's not that I don't believe in the ratio. It's not that at all. It's that we don't do these things retrospectively. We don't go out with a ruler and measure things. We don't. That's not what we do to understand whether something is beautiful. The reason Kate Moss is beautiful is because the first time I saw her, I felt, wow, man, she is absolutely gorgeous. I felt it deep. There was a slide after this slide that was really quite wrong, but I've had to take it. <laughs> the reason the Mona Lisa is beautiful is because da Vinci spent 15 years mastering her. Not with a ruler. <laughs> You've all got dark minds. Really, really dark. <laughs> The reason this sunset is beautiful is because you look at it and your mind and your body and your soul can imagine being there. You can see that sunset. You can hear the waves lapping up against the shore. You can imagine yourself, empathize with the people in the boat. That's the reason that this is a beautiful sunset. That's the reason it's beautiful. So beauty is not a number. It is a trainable emotion. And trainable is the key term for me. Trainable. This is a bit of an epiphany for me that happened a few years ago, that actually you can train yourself to re-recognize emotion. It's relearning something that you lost. Uh, Ray Bradbury, the sci-fi writer, says stuff your head with all sorts of different things from various fields. How interesting is it when like, your boss reads a book on acquisition strategy and all of a sudden everything's about acquisition strategy? 
I do it too, in fairness. I think we all do, right? We read something and then we see everything as like part throughout through that lens. Well, the great thing is the same is true of beauty. If you start to expose your brain to things that are incredibly beautiful, then you'll start to use that and recognize that in your day-to-day -day lives. So the first time I went to this place, Centre de Pompidou in, in Paris, the, the Modern Art Museum, I went at 9 o'clock in the morning. I left at 5 in the evening. It was the first Modern Art Museum I'd ever been to, and it blew my mind. It literally blew my mind to the point that my head was actually hurting. And it wasn't, a, uh, a, it wasn't sort of a bad pain in a way. It was a, a, the, the pain that you get after seeing um, like a really long but awesome film or, or reading a book that you just couldn't put down. It was a pain of a different part of my brain that I'd never exercised before being exercised. And the weeks after that, I saw things just a little bit differently. I'd look at Matt's scarf, for example, and think, my God, that's just a beautiful piece. It reminds me of that Picasso piece. You know? Maybe not that extreme. <laughs> you can do it yourselves. Go to a museum, or if you're at the weekend, you're going to watch a film, choose a beautiful film. Choose something that's a bit different. Choose something that you wouldn't necessarily watch. A Clockwork Orange, dark but beautiful. Um, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Ikiru. Uh, these are really beautiful films. Try that. Just try and expose yourself to something else. This is the Tate Modern, so uh, I'm going to use this as a real example because what I actually do is I encourage my teams to do this all of the time, right? So there's a few people who have worked for me in the past, so I can't even lie. Um, so most of the time when I have a team, at some point we end up having a few things. We always end up having like a music list where everyone shares the music that they like. And we always end up having a film list. And it's not because, you know, um, it's a little contrived. It's because I ask for that to happen naturally. Because I want people to explore different types of music. I want them to explore different types of film. I want them to, to explore different types of art. So I took my team to um, Tate Modern once. It was great. Now, here's the thing. I could empirically prove this to you but it would take away from the message. The weeks after we went to the Tate Modern, the quality of the outputs from the design team in particular was significantly higher. Now, I said I can prove this empirically, and the reason I can prove it empirically is because I did a split test. <laughs> <laughs> but it would take away my point. My point is that I don't want you to prove it empirically. I want you to go out and explore beautiful things. And I want you to trust that just as your boss reads a, a, an acquisition strategy book and talks about acquisition strategy, watching things that are beautiful will enable you and your teams to see more beauty in products. And that's so important because that is the second element of pure products. So here are a few beautiful products that, that I love. Firstly, Limbo, if anyone's got this game on there iPhone. It, again, it's a little bit dark, but it's, uh, it's all in grayscale. It is absolutely beautifully designed. Um, and all of the music and the interactions, they, they resonate very quickly. The first time you play with it, you'll get completely addicted. The second one is this. Um, this is a company I used to work for, Photobox. And I was involved in their first um, iteration of their app. And this is the V3 that was launched just a few days ago. And the moment I open this up, allegiance is aside, the moment I open this up, I saw those photos and just thought, man, they are beautiful. And then the third example is uh, Flickio. So Flickio, I'm very fortunate that I'm um, a, a products consultant with a number of sort of startups. And so this is one of them. The, these, these guys are uh, trying to expose short film as a medium to, to, uh, to the masses. And the first time the designs came back after a few, uh, a, a few inputs from myself, I saw it and I just thought, man, that is absolutely beautiful. So I really encourage you to recognize beauty. And finally, I just want to get into sort of what are the pure products. So if you amalgamate those two things and you get like a pure product, what does it look like? This is one of the purest products I've ever come across. Um, it's the iPod dial. The first time I saw the iPod dial, it was just incredible. It takes a thousand, so a thousand albums and, and tens of thousands of songs, and within a single dial of two concentric circles, I can manage and, and scroll all, way, all the way through them and choose the song that I want. Absolute madness. And then you touch it, and it feels really nice and lovely. Yeah, instant love the first time I saw this. 
But there is a product which I think is the purest product. And um, to explain what it is, uh, can you see, this is my TV. Can you see the handprints on there? <laughs> this created those handprints. This is my daughter. And, um, and she would, I mean, if you've got kids anywhere between two and six, you'll all have these stories, right? She would go to the TV and she would swipe at the TV. She'd swipe at it to change the channel, of course. And so I said, Danny, that's not how you change the channel. Here's a remote. Press the blue button. That will change the channel. And she said, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> no chance. Why would I do that? But of course, Danny isn't special. Well, I mean, she is special. Uh, if you ever see this in the future, Danny, very special to me. <laughs> but what I mean is that she's not, she's not unique as a child. She obviously learnt the skill of swiping the screen, right? Where did she learn the skill of swiping the screen? Well, she learnt it from this product. Um, this is uh, one of only seven, I think, that are still in existence in the world. Uh, this is a BlackBerry Playbook. This is how Danny learned to swipe a screen. Now, what's really interesting about this is that a few months after making the mistake of buying this product, I recognized that, and I bought an iPad. And, um, and I said, Daniel, you can play with this now. This is yours. It's your product. <laughs> Here's the thing. A few weeks in, I find her doing this, playing with my iPad a lot. And as the weeks go on, she plays with it more and more and more. Eventually, I confronted her and I said, Dania, the BlackBerry Playbook is yours. <laughs> and the iPad is Daddy's. And why do you keep going for Daddy's iPad? Why don't you want to play with your Playbook? And she just said, because it's not the same, Dad. It's not the same. You see, a BlackBerry Playbook is profoundly simple, of course, absolutely, undeniably simple. But it is not beautiful. Not like an iPad is beautiful. Not like every touch on an iPad, you recognize the beauty. Not like every single interaction on an iPad. And if a child can recognize that, then it must be beautiful. It must be beautiful. So I am well out of time, so I need to wrap this up. I really want to cement these concepts into your head, so I'm going to go through this super quick. 99% of products in the world you will hardly ever notice, but then there's sort of 1%, 1% that stands out from the crowd, that forces you to take notice, <laughs> that wakes you from your slumber. <laughs> and of that 99%, and of that 1%, 99% make you take notice for a bad reason, a failed app, a blue screen, a late meal, a broken zipper. These products, they suck. Right. But of the 1%, there's 1% left, right? So that's 0.01% of all products. An exclusive club of pure products. Pure products make you go wow, they make you feel awesome, they make you want to sing, to play, to dance, to shout, but most importantly, pure products make you want to tell someone. And they all have two things in common. Firstly, they're simple, like super simple, like as simple as him. Like, <laughs> like, Like, so simple, they're foolproof, idiot-proof, child-proof. They're not simple because they lack complexity or because they ignore the complexity. In fact, to the contrary, they fear the complexity. They hump the hell out of complexity until they've completely mastered complexity. And they have it absolutely in control. And all that is left is pure, sweet, unadulterated, profound simplicity. The other thing that they have in common is that they're beautiful, stunningly beautiful. They make you feel sort of different feel special, feel addictive. <laughs> Pure products start with one thing, a question. A single question that I encourage you to ask at every single stage of development, from inception to wireframing to design to build to test to launch. Every stage, a single, single question, a question that will make your product stand out from every other product in the market, a question that will make you stand out from every other product manager in the company. And that question is, is it beautiful? The answer, no is not acceptable. The answer maybe is not acceptable. The answer I don't know is not acceptable. Not for pure products. 
For pure products, the only acceptable answer is yes, yes, yes. Because it is, because it is their beauty that makes them pure. So, go back to your offices, talk to your teams, <laughs> speak to your leaders, and add three terms into your product lexicon. Profound simplicity, beauty, and all in the service of building the purest of pure products. Thank you.